Welcome to the SWOG Cancer Research Network Spring 2021 Group Meeting. Once again, it's virtual. I have no disclosures, except that I wish we were together face-to-face -to -face in San Francisco. Probably not a big secret. In all seriousness, I'm glad you're here. We've still got a great plenary program for you, as you will see. I'll run through welcomes and goodbyes with a special tribute to a departing executive officer. Then we'll update you on news and accomplishments. Then I'll bring on two important chairs, Dr. Allison Kevin Holt from Recruitment and Retention and Rick Bangs from Patient Advocacy. They will talk about SWAG initiatives rolling out this year that will significantly advance our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. This is important work for our group, and I'm excited to share their and our progress with you. Let's get started. I first want to extend two grateful goodbyes and two warm welcomes. In a big loss, we saw Dr. Mark Lewis step down a few months ago as our Adolescent and Young Adult Committee Chair. He is doubling down on his clinical duties at Intermountain Healthcare in Utah, where he leads care for patients with gastrointestinal cancers. Lucky for us, Mark remains an active SWAG member and continues to serve on our Digital Engagement Committee, an endeavor he helped to start back when it was the Social Media Working Group years ago. Thank you, Mark, for all your work on behalf of SWAG and our youngest patients. I'm glad you're sticking around in any capacity. There's another really tough goodbye to present. After more than 20 years at SWAG, as a member of our Breast Committee, then as that committee's Vice Chair, and finally as Executive Officer for both the Breast and Lung Cancer Committees, Dr. Julie Grelo has left us for a very green pasture indeed, ASCO. In February, she took over as their second Chief Medical Officer, following Dr. Rich Shilsky. You're about to hear a special tribute from our own Dr. Dan Hayes, but I want to say a few things about Julie myself. First, her leadership here at SWAG was exemplary, including her overseeing new chair selections for both the lung and breast committees and providing excellent strategic advice to both of these productive groups. In addition to all those who know Julie, she is a remarkable person. She leads with compassion, integrity, and vision, and will bring her commitment to women and people of color and mentoring the next generation of physicians and researchers onto a global stage. ASCO is lucky to have her. The time is right for her inclusive vision. She was one of my most valuable advisors. Julie, thank you for all you've done for SWAG and all you continue to do to improve cancer care and research. With that, I now introduce Dan Hayes, legendary SWAG and ASCO leader and longtime member of our Breast Translational Medicine Subcommittee. Dan comes to us from the University of Michigan and its Rogel Cancer Center. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate the nice introduction. Um, friends and colleagues, it is a bittersweet moment for this conversation. I wish we were all together. And I know everybody says that before every meeting, but uh, I know we all really miss uh, not having SWAG face to face. I think the personal interactions within SWAG are probably as important as the scientific ones. The other bittersweet part of this, of course, is the point of this particular presentation, and that is that uh, we're losing Julie Grelo from SWAG uh, as she takes the next step in her career, uh, which is a really exciting one as the Chief Medical Officer of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And in many respects, I represent both institutions, both as a former leader in SWAG and also as, a, as most of you know, former past president of ASCO. So it's with great pleasure that I get an opportunity here to speak about Julie Grelo. She's been a longtime colleague. She's been an inspiration to me in my career. And most importantly, she's been a very good friend. Uh, my history with Julie goes way back. To start with, those of you who have ever emailed Julie Grelo knows that her email address is pink at uw.edu. She has devoted most of her career to taking care of patients with breast cancer and improving how we take care of patients with breast cancer. And so I've tried to use a pink line through this entire talk to represent Julie's email address. Julie and I actually first met when she was a resident at Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital and I was an attending physician at the Dana-Farber. Um, I must admit, uh, 
I met a lot of residents in those days, and I suspect she remembers more about coming to the Dana Farber rotating through than I do about having her there. But that's when we first met. More importantly, I followed her rising career under the mentorship of the late Bob Livingston, uh, who did mentor Julie. Bob was a giant in our field. I think we all recognize that. Uh, sadly, we lost Bob a few years ago, but his legacy will live on in the Robert Livingston lecture, which Julie really had a lot to do with, uh, that is given every year at SWAG meetings. From Bob, I heard nothing but good things about Julie, which should come as no surprise to anybody listening to this. Um, I was in CLGB during most of my early career for really the first 20 years or so. But in 2001, uh, with Mark Lippman, I left Georgetown, where I had been for the previous five years, and moved to the University of Michigan. Uh, and there I joined SWAG. Uh, the breast committee at that time was undergoing leadership change. There was a uh, disturbance in the force, if you will, in terms of how the breast committee was going to go. Bob agreed to take over, uh, was appointed as chair, and he appointed Julie as vice chair. And then Peter Rabden, who had really started the, the breast biology committee uh, uh, before I got there, decided to step down. And Dr. Livingston and Dr. Coleman invited me to replace him. And the reason I'm going through all this, this is not about me, but it is about my association with Julie. And I became a co-vice chair of the breast committee with Julie. And that relationship lasted for the next 15 years or so, I think, Julie. I can't remember exactly. But during that period of time, we became quite close friends. In 2016, uh, Dr. Livingston announced he was going to step down as chair of the breast committee. And in most of our opinions, Julie was the logical successor just because that's kind of the way things had gone. Uh, but Dr. Baker, who had taken over the chairmanship of the entire group at that time, elected to have a national search, which uh, I supported entirely. I think it's always good to make sure you pick the folks you want. Um, and to our uh, great pleasure and luck, Dr. Gabriel Horibashi was offered the position and took it. And really did a fabulous job as the chair for the next 10 years. Julie, to her credit, elected to continue as vice chair. The reason I'm saying that, I will never forget a taxi cab ride that she and I had in Atlanta at the ASCO meeting that year. And I said, you know, Julie, you have every right to say, I didn't get the job, I'm gonna step down, I don't wanna do this anymore. But instead, what Julie says, look, we're all in this together. We're all fighting breast cancer. I love Gabriel Hardabashi and I'm, pleased to continue to be the vice chair. And she really was the glue of our committee for many, many years. Now, what has Julie contributed to SWAG? I can't go through everything, I don't have time, but she's contributed as an investigator, a, a PI and a co-PI of several really important and practice changing uh, 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 studies, most importantly related to bisphosphonate use in patients with breast cancer. SO307 is probably her flagship uh, study, uh, was recently published in JNCI, uh, in which uh, she compared three different bisphosphonates, uh, found that there was really no difference in any of the three. Uh, she also uh, so she, uh, uh, participated in other studies uh, related to this. For example, the paper recently published by Dr. Beth Posnick, Julie was the senior author on that regarding the feared complication of osteonecrosis of the jaw, in which they showed that if you do all the things right, you really don't see it very often. Her role and contributions as vice chair of the committee are a legion. She served for 13 years. She made that committee run smoothly, efficiently, and productively. Most of you don't see all the work she did in the background to make it work as smoothly as she did. And then the last seven years, she served as an executive officer. Dr. Blanke offered the opportunity, and she was uh, in charge of breast and lung committee. She oversaw the introduction of the lung map study, a groundbreaking study that all of you are aware of. She was integral uh, to the Young Investigators Training Course and the SWAG Latin American Initiative, which follows on her real devotion to global oncology. And she was a member of the Digital Engagement Committee, which really changed the way SWAG does things, incorporating digital tools to improve the clinical trial infrastructure. Uh, she even wrote a paper about that uh, with her colleagues. So Julie Grelos had an enormous impact 
on the way that this organization has continued to work over the last many years. How about her contributions to our patients? Again, uh, I don't have time to go through everything she did, but outside of SWAT, she's been the co-investigator of the University of Washington Breast Board for many years. Uh, she and others started the so-called Inspiration Expedition, which is an annual think tank regarding breast cancer research that many of us have participated in and have come away with new ideas for grants and protocols. It's really been an influential meeting. She was a communications chair of ASCO and many, many other contributions to ASCO, but probably that was one of her greatest. And for what I believe she is most known for, she's been a devoted global oncologist. In fact, at any given time when I've emailed her through the years, the answers I got back were at two in the morning or four in the morning, but that's because her time was probably in the middle of the day because she was somewhere else in the world, 12 or 15 or 18 hours different than Eastern Standard Time. In fact, we got the joke, uh, you know, where in the world is Julie Brelo? This happens to be a picture of her and her uh, uh, friends who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro several years ago. And you can recognize Julie's smile underneath all those clothes as they made it to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, in recognition of women against cancer. For all of her contributions as a global oncologist, I was very proud to get to uh, uh, give Julie the ASCO Humanitarian Award in 2018 for her work as a medical director and team physician uh, for Team Survivor Northwest, for her work as the founder of the Women's Empowerment Cancer Advocacy Network, for her work as co-chair of the Breast Cancer Initiative 2.5, and for all of her work around the world in helping women with breast cancer uh, live better and longer. And I was quite proud to be the one to get to present this to Julie uh, as my role as past president of ASCO. Dr. Julie Grelo has also been my friend. She's always been available um, no matter where she is. I would get a reply to any of my emails uh, uh, when I would ask her advice or what was going on or what we should be doing. And she's also been positive supportive. All of you know that uh, there is a bureaucracy in what we do. Uh, it's easy to get frustrated. I would send, you know, commonly send her emails saying, ah, she kind of emailed back and say, don't worry, we'll get this done. And we did. And again, for Julie, I'm very grateful for all the calming uh, aspects of your life to help me. Julie Grail has been our friend for years and years. This is the Breast Committee leadership around 2018. Uh, uh, with Bill Barlow, uh, Deborah Trepathy, Gabriel Murtabaji. I'm sure we'd all agree that, uh, that Julie has been an integral part of what we do. Also, as a friend, I have not yet had an opportunity, but Julie and her husband, Hugh, have invited me to come fishing with them on several times. And this is not fish as in fluorescent in situ hybridization. This is fish as in catching really big fish. And although she wasn't a member of the ASCO CAP her two guidelines for fish, she's been a major player in fish. And you'll notice she's the cover girl here for Salmon and Steelhead Journal. I'm sure it's a journal most of you take along with the New England Journal of Medicine. I certainly try to read it on a monthly basis. And uh, so there's our buddy Julie uh, with a fish much bigger than I've ever caught. So what's the next adventure for Julie? Well, I think all of you know she's uh, been uh, named to be uh, the successor of Rich Shilsky as the ASCO chief medical officer. These are really big shoes to fill, Julie. Uh, uh, Rich has uh, had a huge impact on ASCO, but of all the people I heard about who were being considered, I cannot be more pleased that our society has chosen you to help lead us into the uh, next generation of uh, what ASCO does uh, in many respects with clinical trials, with cancer care. Uh, and Julie, you're a great choice and I could not have thought of anyone better. So thanks, Julie, from all your colleagues and friends in SWAG, from me personally, and mostly from all the patients in the state of Washington, in the United States and worldwide who have benefited from all you have and all you will do. So to finish up, uh, in the classic, uh, you know, I'm not losing a son, I'm gaining a daughter that we say at weddings. We're not losing a valued colleague, we're gaining a great ASCO CMO. 
congratulations, Julie, and we look forward to the rest of your career, and thanks for all you've done. Thanks so much, Dan, for your tribute. Julie, we will miss you dearly. Now for those warm welcomes I promised. After Mark's departure from AYA, we extended an offer to Vice Chair Dr. Becky Johnson to take on the chair role for the committee. I am so grateful she said yes. Becky has long been a positive, productive force on that committee and will make an exceptional leader for our AYA efforts. Becky has successfully recruited Dr. Lucia Nappi to serve as Vice Chair. Lucia is a rising star at the British Columbia Cancer Agency and the co-investigator of S1823, an important biomarker-driven testis cancer trial we're running in conjunction with Children's Oncology Group. Lucia developed S1823 through our Hope Foundation-sponsored Young Investigator Training Course, and we're excited that she has accepted this new leadership role with our group. I think Becky and Lucia will be a dynamic duo for the AYA committee. Finally, I want to welcome on board Dr. Ann Chang as our new Executive Officer for the Breast and Lung Committees. With lung map heating up, we wanted an EO with true expertise in thoracic malignancies. Anne, a medical oncologist at Yale University in its Milo Cancer Center, fits that bill. Anne is a world-class researcher in small cell lung cancer with a focus on developing translational studies. Anne used funding from a Coltman Fellowship from the Hope Foundation to develop the biomarker-driven phase three trial S1709EA5163, a major frontline study for non-squamous patients that will yield prognostic and predictive immune signatures. Anne has a robust portfolio of trials at Yale and has received NCI SPORE funding to study the mechanisms of acquired immunotherapy resistance in small cell lung cancer. She is also an NCOR champion and is proud that 85% of Yale community physicians accrue to Yale trials. Anne is a bright light, and I'm thrilled to have her join SWAG as a member of my leadership team. Anne, congratulations and welcome. Now for news. As you know, 2020 was a challenging year for our group. The pandemic put a significant strain on our members and staff, upending our professional and personal lives. We had to rethink and redo so many processes and projects. And there was a great deal of loss of life, freedom, and a sense of security. Despite this hardship, if you saw our annual 2020 impact report in January, we had an incredibly productive year. In 2020, SWAG members still managed to activate 14 trials, review 32 concepts, enroll 3,132 patients on the SWAG run trials, publish 107 articles, and make 73 presentations. That's remarkable. To be sure, the pandemic has hurt us. Accrual is still lower than I would like. But Dr. Joe Unger has a new SWAG publication coming out this spring that shows that while our accrual did take a hit overall, our treatment trial enrollment wasn't significantly affected by COVID. Stay tuned for that article. When it publishes, I will be sure to share the results in the Frontline blog. As part of our own pandemic response, Drs. Julie Graylo and Lee Ellis came up with the idea for Best of SWAG, a one-hour lightning round webinar highlighting our most important and interesting publications and presentations. The idea was to give members bite-sized capsules of our best and latest work in an effort to keep us all connected during quarantine. We held our first Best of SWAG event last July and held our second in January. We had great turnout and got great reviews. A huge majority of participants who responded to a post-webinar survey said they would attend another. So we'll oblige and hold those Best of SWAG events a few times each year. We'll record them and post a link on swag.org and on Twitter so you can see what we're producing. My thanks to the presenters and their committee chairs who came online to answer questions put into the meeting chat. We are still tweaking the presentation format to make it even better for you. Stay tuned. The National Cancer Institute has been hard at work rolling out its latest round of master protocols, and SWAG is involved in much of that work. MiloMatch, which I am especially excited about, is a master protocol being developed under the direction of Dr. Harry Erba, our Leukemia Committee Chair. 
This trial uses an umbrella design that will test new treatments for population subgroups of AML and MDS, with a total accrual goal of 2,000 patients. MyloMatch really breaks new ground. It's a true joint effort with our NCTN partners and the NCI. For the first time in any clinical trial, NCI is creating universal patient identifiers, something we've requested for years. So MyloMatch participants can be tracked across NCTN groups as they get assigned to different treatments and join different sub-studies. SWAG senior leaders approved the first MyloMatch sub-study on a triage call in December, and then in March approved the master screening and reassessment protocols. Both are now with NCI for review. We hope both the master protocol and the first sub-study will launch simultaneously later this fall. Stay tuned for more news on Immunomatch, another SWAG-led effort. I want to report to you on other important work happening with our executive team. For several months, our deputy chair, Dr. Primo Lucky Lara, has been leading the Protocol Resources Task Force, a group made of 13 senior investigators and senior staff. The goal of the task force is to build more flexibility into the finances and staffing underlying our system of creating and launching protocols so we can meet the needs of all of our committees, whether they launch one new trial a year or 10. We want to be sure that everyone gets the protocol coordinator and statistician time that they need, and that distribution of this time is fair, effective, and sustainable. Flexibility is the watchword here, and the task force is analyzing historical data and developing valid data sources to measure and analyze productivity and support more dynamic allocation of staff time. Nathan Erickson, our Chief of Administration, is working with our new data guru, Eric Rye, on data visualization tools that can help us plan our work. We expect these tools will be useful for committee leaders as well as our management staff. The task force hopes to wrap up their work in the next few weeks and deliver recommendations to me and the SWAG executive officers. If approved and adopted, we will then present these recommendations to committee chairs and ultimately to all of you. We know this work isn't a one-time effort. Distributing our protocol resources in a flexible, effective, equitable way will require continuous review, analysis, and action. I want to tell you about our Plain Language Initiative, which will roll out this year on SWAG.org. We'll be publishing summaries of all open SWAG trials online, written at a middle school reading level, with the goal of improving awareness and hopefully accrual. The assumption is that as more people who know about cancer trials and understand them, more people will opt to enroll in them. Plain language is also a way to break down barriers and make trials more accessible to everyone, regardless of educational level, income level, or race and ethnicity. For this reason, I see this effort as an essential component of our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts here at SWAG. To accommodate plain language summaries, changes will be made to SWAG.org with tweaks to the homepage and a new four patients section on the main navigation bar. We'll also have unique pages for each summary, which can be printed, emailed, or shared on social media. Each newly launched SWAG trial gets two weeks of promotion on Twitter. Our account now includes more than 10,000 followers. For context, SWAG has led the NCTN effort toward plain language using a HOPE Foundation grant to convene a 2019 cross-network meeting that resulted in a template for creating trial summaries uniformly across all of our groups. NRG and CCTG are also beginning to use that template, and the Alliance is publishing trial results in plain language. I'm proud SWAG is a leader here. As I noted in a recent Frontline blog post, SWAG is serving as a contributor and a sponsor of the Cancer History Project, a new effort led by the editors of the Cancer Letter. The free website aims to be a Wikipedia for cancer research, offering articles, research studies, biographies, obituaries, photos, and even books. I'm proud to serve on the project's editorial board, along with fellow SWAG leaders Dan Hayes, Fred Hirsch, and Nancy Davidson, as well as ASCO's Cliff Huddis and AACR's Margaret Foti. On the sponsor side, SWAG and Hope are in good company. ASCO is a sponsor of the Cancer History Project, as are the ACT for NIH, City of Hope, and more. You can see the SWAG and HOPE pages up on the Cancer History Project website and check out other content, including a timeline of milestones in cancer history, an educator's toolkit on Jim Allison and immunotherapy, 
and a history of the AACR. As a cancer trials group founded in 1956, we're proud of our history, which made the collaboration a perfect fit. Finally, I want to thank our top accruing member sites from 2020. These are the hospitals and cancer centers that registered the most swab credited patients to swab managed trials. From our main member and lab sites, the 2020 top accruers are University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, University of Rochester Wilmette Cancer Institute, City of Hope, USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the University of Utah Huntsman Cancer Institute. For our NCORE sites, the 2020 top accruers were Southeast Clinical Oncology Research Consortium NCORE, Gulf South Minority Underserved NCORE, Cancer Research Consortium NCORE, Upstate Carolina Consortium NCORE, and the Catholic Health Initiatives NCORE. Thanks to members at all these locations for your support of SWAG. And now for news from our Hope Foundation for Cancer Research. The first HOPE Award I'll announce is from the SWAG Early Exploration and Development, or SEED Fund. SEED Fund awards encourage preliminary research that may lead to a SWAG trial or translational medicine study. This year's SEED Fund Award goes to Dr. Randall Holcomb of the University of Hawaii Cancer Center for his project, Patient-Centered Video Education Intervention to Improve Rural Cancer Care Delivery. Congratulations, Dr. Holcomb. Under the VA Integration Support Program, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Centers receive a one-time $50,000 grant to help them enroll veterans into trials run by SWAG and other members of the NCTN. This means more veterans get targeted treatments, immunotherapies, and other cutting-edge medicines. This year's winners of VA Integration Support Program Awards are the Corporal Michael J. Crescens VA Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the VA Boston Healthcare System in Boston, Massachusetts. Congratulations to both centers. We've now given more than $700,000 to 22 VA centers across the country since our VA program began in 2015. I believe our efforts have jump-started a national interest in offering more cancer clinical care study options to our veterans. Stay tuned for an announcement about HOPE's Impact Award, as well as special recognition awards for humanitarianism and mentoring. This wraps up the award section of the agenda, but I want to stay on the topic of the HOPE Foundation for one minute more. Our public charity continues to evolve and improve over time. The Foundation is updating its website and its fundraising efforts, including the launch of new planned giving options. HOPE is also front and center to our efforts to make SWAG a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization, and is funding many of the projects you're about to hear about. I wanted to thank Joe Horn and her staff and the entire HOPE board for always backing innovation in our group. I'd now like to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Allison Cabin Holt, who chairs the SWAG Recruitment and Retention Committee, which spearheads our diversity efforts. Allison is the Associate Director of the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. She's here to tell us about diversity efforts she is leading here at SWAG. Allison, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Dr. Blanke, for this opportunity to share some of the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, which I will also refer to as DEI, that will be taking place in the coming year. I hope that all of SWAG will embrace these opportunities to promote equity and the important work that is being done. With regard to this presentation, I have nothing to disclose nor conflicts of interest. Images seen in this presentation were taken from the unsplash.com and virginia.com websites. My name is Allison Caban Holt and I am the chair of the Recruitment and Retention Committee and I'll be sharing current efforts and future directions in diversity, equity and inclusion at SWAP. Though the concepts of diversity, equity and inclusion are not new by any means, recent events have shown a bright spotlight on them. The death of George Floyd and the ensuing social unrest made a strong statement that awakened the nation to a number of inequities. Then COVID hit and the disparate rates of virus spread and increased mortality 
for some segments of the population has made it difficult to ignore the inequities. These inequities based on race, culture, socioeconomic status that affect health. Called into question has also been the heart of science and scientific discoveries and treatments at a time when they are desperately needed. Whether the public should trust scientists and what we in the research fields are doing to be trustworthy with patients, which we need to advance, to advance improvements in health has certainly come to our door. There has been an elevation of the issues of DEI and how social determinants relate to health, healthcare access, and access to research and clinical trials. What is diversity, equity, and inclusion? Right now, the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion are being used quite a bit, but what do they mean? Diversity is sometimes called representativeness, and it's where a group might be comprised of members that reflect the composition of a society. In our case, this certainly comes up with regard to patients who are included in research studies and whether the, part the participants reflect those who get the particular disease. I would like to describe equity using this image. It is how it is used to distinguish equity from equality, which is an important distinction. Starting with the lower image, in equality, everyone gets the same thing regardless of what their specific need may be. Everyone gets the same bike and that's equal, but clearly that bike is not the right choice for everyone who wants to ride. In the top image is a depiction of equity where everyone can ride and has access to the appropriate bike for what their need is. The beauty is that everyone is able to participate. This is why we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, not diversity, equality, and inclusion. Equity also includes valuing varied perspectives and seeing these different perspectives as being on equal footing. Inclusion prompts us to develop answers to creating environments that are conducive to, to feedback, making it possible for diverse perspectives to be heard. Why should we care about diversity, equity, and inclusion? It's part of the strategic plan and, and that's great. But beyond that, I posit that diversity, equity, and inclusion are important for good science. Having diverse perspectives, diverse research participants, asking varied research questions, inclusive interpretation of findings and various perspectives being brought together to develop solutions will enhance the important research that is being conducted at SWAP. Research findings should not only apply to a select group of people under very specific circumstances and leave out large segments of people. That makes the application of such findings significantly less feasible and much less fair. Research findings need to be applied to a wide swath of people and to do the most good. That means diverse and inclusive research participant pools and equity in access to clinical trials. Further, as DEI are core values of SWAV, we must first start with making our leadership and membership diverse. To this end, the Recruitment and Retention Committee has created a working group that Dr. Colmar Figueroa Mosley, who's a whiz with acronyms, has coined DIBS, which stands for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Strategic Working Group. The meaning behind it is we're all in, we got DIBS. The mission of our group is to promote diversity among SWOG members who are at the forefront of conducting cutting edge cancer research and in those taking part in that research. And our vision is that SWOG leadership and membership will become diverse enough to represent and reflect American society and to support and advocate for diverse patient enrollments in clinical trials. We're still refining our mission statement and how we will accomplish our goals, but we have begun. In response to the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, the Hope Foundation and Genentech sent out a call for proposals specifically about DEI. In collaboration with the patient advocates, digital engagement and recruitment and retention committees, we have applied for and received funding that will be used to forward DEI efforts in SWOG. One of the efforts that will result from this will be the creation of DEI champions. 
These champions will be interested individuals who will be trained and equipped with skills to be a support to research committees and PIs and to help promote and identify research opportunities for diversity, equity, and inclusion. They will help researchers to implement team science. And the intention is for research committees to have available to them champions who can help them define and achieve their diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Another effort from the funding will be that we will benefit from expert assistance of a DEI consulting firm. Pope Consultant Consulting has been chosen. They will help us in the strategic planning of DEI and SWAG and help to make DEI a great strength of our organization. They will help us to identify methods for improving leadership and membership diversity. And they will also help us to understand and actuate improvements in our science with DEI as core values. Poe Consulting will also help us develop a current state assessment of DEI and SWOG. As scientists and professionals, we can agree that we won't know how to get to our goals if we don't know where we are and what we have to work with. Current state assessment will address the structures and systems that are currently in place in SWOG that help facilitate greater DEI and to identify our strengths and opportunities. The consultants will also interview leaders at SWOG to better understand views of DEI and perceptions of what changes may need to be implemented to get us to where we want to be. Pope Consulting will also provide inclusive leadership training to equip leaders to identify opportunities to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to align on a DEI vision for SWAG. It's important that leaders are prepared for advancing DEI. These are a few things that are in the works with DEI efforts, and I hope all will join in when given the opportunity. I also want to thank the Recruitment and Retention Committee. I appreciate the experience and expertise each and every member brings to the table and their willingness to share their share to enhance our work in wonderful ways. It is a true pleasure to work with all of you. And until we see each other in person, help others, think positive, be calm, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk and for all you and the Recruitment and Retention Committee are doing on behalf of the group. Now, I'd like to introduce Rick Bangs, the long-standing and highly effective chair of our Patient Advocate Committee. Rick and Allison have been partners in nearly all of our diversity efforts, and Rick is the architect of the Team Science at SWAG training series. This year, we will roll out the sixth and final installment of that training series, which lays out a new methodology for increasing enrollment among underrepresented patients with cancer. Rick is here to tell you about that rollout and the implementation science fellow who will drive that work. Rick. Take it away. Thank you, Dr. Blanke. I appreciate the opportunity to present two of our 2021 DEI programs, and I'm excited to share this work with our SWAG community. I have no relevant disclosures. Because this is plenary, I wanna start with a provocative question. How can we improve diversity and representativeness of clinical trial participants? The question is simple and straightforward, but the answers may not be. Allison and I want you to consider this question not only during my presentation, but after. At SWAG, we recognize that DEI is good science and a core value, but it is also a team sport one where each of us should understand our role enabling DEI from within the SWAG team. For the purposes of this presentation, the question that I asked will be more focused and more actionable. As members of SWAG study teams, how can we improve diversity and representativeness of clinical trial participants? We know people want to make a difference and they want to be empowered. They want solutions and ideas. And that is exactly what we are providing now. We set out in 2019 to make this happen. 
we received generous funding from Genentech and exceptional support from the Hope Foundation. We carved out this scope of work. We would focus on things that are actionable by study teams. We would build diversity and representativeness into trials from the ground up, spanning the entire clinical trial life cycle and leveraging team science at SWOG training and methodology. We would align ourselves with FDA guidance on this topic. And we would represent best, good, and emerging practices. From the beginning, this has been a recruitment and retention and patient advocate committee partnership. But even then, we did not go it alone. We sought support from other SWAG stakeholders along with NCTN, NCI, and external experts. They were every bit as excited as we were about the possibilities. Our results were enriched by this outreach and Allison and I wanna thank and recognize the team. Our primary output is a methodology or framework spanning the clinical trial life cycle and driven by four critical success factors. Team resources, including funding and people, outreach, goal setting and management, and plans and countermeasures. This is all about improvement. And these are the areas where we believe we can be better. This is how we will walk the talk. Though clearly much broader, like the original Team Science at SWOG methodology to engage patient advocates, this methodology started with stakeholders. What do they want? What do they need? What are they empowered to do? How do they do it? We created a dozen strategies for study teams to use. Two for each of the five stages of the clinical trial life cycle, define, review, design, implement, and share. And two general overarching strategies. These strategies collectively define our methodology. It is important to note that we expect our DEI champions to work with others to bring this work to life. We are also very aware of the need to calibrate the use of the strategies and the rigor within the strategies to the trial and the context. One size will not fit all. We will work with the SWAG team to refine this. We have created 30 to 45 minutes of training on the methodology and a field guide to provide additional hands-on guidance on the implementation of each strategy. Each of the 12 strategies has the same structure in the field guide. For each strategy, you will find three parts spanning two to three pages. A description of the strategy, best practices for implementing it, suggestions, checklists, and actions for you to try. Actually, we provided a bonus 13th strategy. So let's call our methodology a baker's dozen. The 13th strategy is not the responsibility of the study team, however, as the 13th strategy precedes the identification of a concept and the establishment of the study team. I'm going to use this bonus strategy as an example of what's in the field guide. The sample strategy is analyze portfolio and identify gaps. Its purpose is to clearly articulate the current state 
of diversity and representativeness within a committee or cancer context. The trials within that portfolio are considered along with incidents and outcomes by subpopulations. And the current underlying science through a DEI lens. Using our bonus strategy, the committee or working group will articulate historical results, lessons learned, and explore future opportunities. We have included a discussion guide that can be used to set up a collaborative meeting to assess and to harness the opportunities. The strategy looks both forward and backward, but drives participants to a plan that can and should be prioritized. In the spirit of full transparency, I will tell you that it is our hope that the SWAG research committees will all, at some point, give this strategy a try. The rollout of team science at SWAG module six training will include the roles listed here, though other SWAG roles are welcome to participate. We expect to have training in the SWAG learning management system in the May, June timeframe. I wanna speak briefly about some related recalibration of the patient advocate committee that dovetails with our DEI goals and the team science DEI methodology. More than a year and a half ago, we split the advocate roles in two, creating a brand new role for community advocates. The research advocates continue as our clinical trial experts embedded in SWAG committees. The new community advocates are our community experts providing input from and sharing with their communities. We have approval for 10 community advocates. We currently have five in the roles shown here in blue and you can see them pictured on the right. I am pleased to, the, to announce the addition this very month of two new advocates in the roles in green. The roles in red are now open and we will work to fill them in the future. If we are to be successful with our implementation of DEI, we must understand the needs of the communities listed here and others not listed and deliver meaningful change to them in terms of trial access, trial participation, scientific understanding, and sharing of trial results. I am confident that SWAG will do so and change the standard of care for them in a meaningful way. In closing, I wanna thank you for considering the question that I raised at the start. How can we improve diversity and representativeness of clinical trial participants? please continue to seek answers to that question for SWAG as a whole, and most importantly for yourself as part of SWAG. I am excited to be part of this amazing team of SWAG clinical trialists who will collectively make DEI a strength. If you have comments or questions, please email me at rbangs at swag.org. Thank you, and I hope to see all of you in person soon. Thank you, Rick, for your update. This work is so relevant and essential to cancer research right now. I'm grateful for all the progress our members are making to ensure we're the most representative and inclusive organization we can be. We've come so far, but we still have a long way to go. With that, I close the 2021 SWAG Virtual Group Meeting Plenary too. Check out the meeting agenda book, which features our top accruing sites and updates from our disease and research support committee chairs. The book gives you an easy and fast way to get up to speed with the group. You can find it on swag.org and on a special group meeting website. And try out the networking lounge. 
Enjoy the rest of the meeting. I hope to see you in person in the fall.